Thank you for inviting me to Aminogen. And um, should we start by you um, telling me a little bit about yourself and about Aminogen? My name is John Lambert. I'm actually a PhD biochemist uh, with a PhD from Cambridge University in the 1976 then. And after several years postdoc, I came to Boston in 1982 to join the research group that was at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute that actually was funded by venture capitalists who formed a company called Immunogen. So I've actually been at Immunogen for now 29 years in county. And I was actually a second scientist by it. And, and so after the company incubated within the Dane Farber Cancer Institute until 87, and then uh, set off on its own and went public in 89. And it's been a long journey for Immunogen and the ADC technology. What's been the biggest hurdles um, that have stood in the way of people having faith in the ADC in reality? So when you think uh, back in 1981-82, we were the goal of immunogen from the very beginning was to develop antibody targeted uh, cytotoxic agents. Of course, at the time, humanization hadn't been invented. And so the early compounds of urine antibodies linked to chemotherapy drugs. We worked with doxorubicin and with methotrexate. And the alternate path uh, was to use cytotoxic proteins. And ricin was popularly used, diphtheria toxin for others. Immunogen had a big project around using ricin and developed a form of ricin called blocked ricin where the, the binding sites of the ricin molecule, two cells were blocked and we replaced it with an antibody and actually went to the clinic in I think uh, 89, 88, 89 with an, with an anti-CD19 antibody, immune antibody linked to blocked ricin and actually that had a clinical life until it was discontinued in phase three in 1996. Meanwhile, the small drug effort in, with Dr. Rubis and methotrexate, we'd stop that. What we had concluded was we needed to have the potency of ricin in order to make have the ADC technology to deliver enough cytotoxic payload to kill cells. So the chemists started to look for small molecular weight drugs that were as potent as ricin on a molar basis. So that instead of linking dozens and dozens of molecules of the cytotoxic payload to an antibody, which turns into an insoluble lump, uh, we could actually design a, an antibody drug conduit with just three or four molecules attached. So that actually, that really describes the 80s. Uh, the ricin technology, uh, there were limitations of immunogenicity, of toxicity, actually, like the ricin, the antibody drug conjugate armed with ricin wasn't exactly invisible to the body, so the, the dose you could give was limited by that. Uh, by then, we had developed the humanization technology, as many other groups had, that we developed our own. And we managed to uh, get through that area and reintroduce into the clinic now next generation compound, which were humanized antibodies linked to our cytotoxic payload based on the tensin drugs. And TDM1 now in the late stage clinical trials is the, is the leading compound with that technology. So, in a short time, I've described nearly 30 years of work. I think the biggest hurdles were all the failures of the 80s. Uh, failures of lack of potency with the, with the linking drugs like doxorubicin. And, and actually the toxicity of, of the ricin-based immunotoxins. And I think the earliest ADC that got approved, uh, which is Mylotar, uh, now no longer approved, or has been withdrawn from the market, didn't quite solve the, the issues of off-target toxicity. 
turned out to be as critical an issue to solve as the potency. Once you have the potency, the linked drug, the, the ADC, should be actually a very low toxicity. And, and unfortunately, Mylotard was just proved to be not much different from chemotherapy when you think of efficacy set against toxicity. In the, the, the therapeutic window was essentially negligible, just as it is for most classic chemotherapeutic agents. So I think that was a big barrier to persuade people that actually the metansinoid payload we had addressed this problem and actually had a payload that was potent enough but actually you could maintain plasma concentrations sufficiently high to have a therapeutic effect without much toxicity. The goal of the technology after all is to deliver potency but to, have, to actually get away from the toxicity of chemotherapy. Do you think that a regulatory approval will change of the thinking towards ADCs? I, well, I think an approval now of, of, if you like, the next generation of ADC beyond myelotar, that is, antibody drug conduits armed with the tubular energy payloads, being metansin or orostatin, I think it will be a big milestone. And I think the field has, I think, has already, the clinical data has been reported, and I think from uh, the perspective of do people believe ADCs will work? I think that, or I think people are beyond that now. But I think the first approval of this uh, generation of ADC that truly now brings to bear the activity that everyone hoped, the specificity activity, with the relatively benign side effects, that was the ultimate goal of ADC technology. I think it will be an important milestone. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I hope that. Uh, it actually that happens this year, it would be nice. Could we um, talk a little bit about Aminogen and could you tell me about your most exciting in-house projects? I think one of our most exciting projects is our IMG 901, which is the antibody target CD56. Now, part of the reason for excitement, it's the furthest advanced of our wholly owned compounds in the clinic. And uh, we've embarked on two different clinical trials, one in small cell lung cancer, one in multiple myeloma, that are each, uh, each of which are in combination with drugs that are part of the standard of care for the respective diseases. Uh, embarking on these trials is based on uh, the single agent activity that we've seen uh, with IMG 901, as it is called, or Lorbertuzumab and Tansin. Uh, and also on preclinical data showing the, that uh, the Lorbertuzumab and Tansin combines well with the drugs used in the standard of care uh, in either small cell lung cancer or multiple myeloma. So the reason, I, I think this is an exciting, I'm looking forward to the data emerging. Next week at ASCO we'll be talking about uh, lower tuzum and metansin in multiple myeloma in a in combination study with uh, Reprimid, well, and uh, the, the, I think we've got some promising early data, though it is very early in this trial. Patient numbers are rather low still. But I think both of, both of these routes can set up uh, uh, tri uh, potentially pivotal combination studies. I think these combination trials take advantage of, in fact, the relatively benign toxicity profile of the ADC. So, for some diseases, uh, it, so then a, a logical and obvious development path is to try and improve outcomes by combining with existing standard of care. In the case of small cell lung cancer, for example, the standard of care has been a, a platinum drug with a topicide and that hasn't changed for 30, 40 years. No one has been able to add an extra modality to that. And from the chemotherapy point of view, you could say that those two drugs are right at the toxic limit. If you added anything else, Either that anything else you have to back off the dose, so it's not effective, or back off the dose of one of the other 
to the address because they're not effective. The benign toxicity profile of lobotrism and metamsin allows you to build the combined and effective new modality on top of the existing modality. And uh, certainly the clinical data suggests that this is a promising approach. And we look forward to that data. The other two I'm excited about are drugs not yet in the clinic. A month ago, at ACR, we revealed uh, compounds that have been working on for a couple of years. Uh, one ADC targeting CD37 uh, for non Hodgkin's lymphoma. This would be a metantinoid conjugate where the antibody already has activity. In fact, it was selected to have rituximab like activity. Uh, and in fact, in all our preclinical assays, the antibody as a naked antibody has superior activity to rituximab, especially in the direct induction of apoptosis. And then on top of that activity, it has been augmented, if you like, by serving that antibody into a metansinoid ADC. And we're in the final stages of putting together the MD for that compound. Uh, another compound we also unveiled at ASCR last month is an ABC targeting the folate receptor, which is highly overexpressed on ovarian cancer and on a portion of lung cancer. Again, this in this case, the folate receptor, one wouldn't expect to develop an active antibody to that receptor. The receptor just delivers folate into the cell. And indeed, the antibodies were, the antibodies were made to that target, not active. But we selected an antibody that was especially uh, potent at delivering metamsin into the cell from, this, from we probably made 2,000 antibodies to that particular target. But Whittled down to the lead antibody was especially good at delivering the intensity into the cell. And uh, that compound probably is six or seven months behind in terms of its IND status, so we expect to file an IND for that early in 2012. But both of these are exciting compounds. We think we put all our learnings in the you know, our 30 years of experience into the design of these ADCs. And, uh, Looking forward to getting some clinical data with them too. Is it complicated filing an IND for an ADC? No. It's uh, complicated. I don't know if it's complicated. Uh, if you're used to only filing INDs for a naked antibody, then it's actually a small molecular weight drug component. And then a third component that is putting the two together. You have to think of it as, as a three component system. You need to present data about the manufacturing of the antibody, about the manufacturing of the small molecule, and the manufacturing of the conjugate. I'm not sure it's so complicated, it's just that it, you just, the CMC part just has these three elements. Uh, and so there's certainly more work involved. But, uh, it is what we do, so I'm not sure I find it particularly complicated anymore. Uh, but each has their own uh, elements. So, so it is, in a way, combining a biologics approach with a small molecule approach. And of course, the conjugate truly has elements of both. As far as pharmacology and toxicology, it's a drug. And you have to understand its pharmacology, its mechanism of action, and and its safety in, in, in studies. So, so again, it combines elements of both the cytotoxic and dealing with an antibody. So there are elements of both in, in the country. Um, if you could talk about target selection, what are the main differences between solid and liquid tumors? I think uh, you know, at one level, I could say there's no difference, but uh, but there is clearly a good target on the on the tumor cell, be it solid or liquid. If the biology of the target is right for an ADC approach, it's a good target. But the one difference is that uh, liquid tumors, it is a tissue you can remove entirely, 
and without uh, and apart from the fact that the short term consequences of, of maybe propensity to infection and so on, the new, the new tissue will rebuild from stem cells and bone marrow. So many of the targets people go after in lymphoma are actually tissue specific targets, not CD20, not CD37, not CD19. So you can remove all these cells and actually once the therapy is over, that eventually do repopulate B cell. So solid tumor targets, that tends to be more complicated. You, it's, hmm. There are some targets that may be categorized as tissue specific. But it, it's certainly a, a, a more difficult paradigm. People really search for targets that may be tumor associated, like overexpressed or two with their interest and it's the overexpression that seems to be responsible for to, to achieve the level of potency that may be associated with internalization rates and so on. Whereas normal tissue with normal levels of that too, while they do take up the compound as evidenced by PK, uh, they don't they either don't take up enough the mechanism to hit them, or they're non-dividing cells, which of course with two billion agents provides another level of specificity, really only clear cells when they try to define it. So, so I think that, that would be one fundamental difference in targets. With subtle liquid tumors, people are keen to go for tissue specific targets, which can be very specific. Mm -hmm. I think another approach, uh, another factor is that perhaps just more is known about targets on liquid tumors. In the, the whole differ differentiation of hematopoietic cells from bone marrow stem cells is exceedingly well described. Uh, immunologists who were the first to sort of apply monoclonal antibody technology to characterizing cell surface molecules actually have been working with, with these systems 30 years essentially, and uh, also the cells are easier to study since they can grow readily, or you can assay them readily in liquid culture. So I think there is just more known about targets on uh, on hybrid cells of hematopoietic lineage than with solid tumors. That would be another difference in, in, in how you get at targets. What payload technologies do you find most exciting? Well, uh, I think it's clear that the, the payloads that are now about to yield a couple of uh, very promising drugs are high potent to the image. I think there has, I think there the, the advantage that they have in the, the normal tissue metabolism. After all, when you inject an ADC into the body, if 5% of it ends up in the tumour, that would be a lot. 95% you know, will get metabolised elsewhere, so it all goes somewhere. Uh, I think to have two billion agent payloads does give you this level of specificity that only dividing cells are killed. So, if that's somewhere where antibody, where the protein of the ADC is Removed from the circulation, metabolized. If those cells are not readily dividing, they're essentially unharmed by the intensive mode or the orostat, and then eventually that can be eliminated from the body. So I think these highly potent tubular agents, they're going with SGM35 and TDM1, will is a very exciting new compound. To achieve that specificity with DNA, agents, for example, which is another big drug class, especially if you look at classic chemo. It has been harder, and I think it's to get that therapeutic window has, has been more of a challenge and witness myelitar. There was activity, but there was also, you know, toxicity, so it sort of looked like chemotherapy. Uh, so the same issue of very narrow, essentially zero therapeutic window, that the doses that were active were also toxic. So I would be excited by 
uh, a new class of agent, a non-Tooling agent, uh, that would actually meet the criteria that the Tooling agents have set, and that is good activity as an ADC with modest toxicity. So we know we know what now an ideal ADC should look like. And so new payloads that we and others are working on, but we have to meet this criteria. And uh, you know, again, we've got one yet. So you say what payloads excite me? The two that are going to make products excite me. Uh, but, but we recognize that not all cancers are susceptible to a single drug class. So there are certain some cancers that aren't particularly amenable to a tumor agent. And delivering it by an antibody in the form of an ADC doesn't necessarily get over those hurdles. Is, is the cells of this disease type sensitive to a tubular agent? Yeah? That is a question we generally ask now before we, when we're assessing a target on what diseases we are after. And there are certainly the answer is sometimes no. There are some cancers where tubular agents, well, usually tried, but they're, they've never proven very successful. And those cancers are probably not ones to target with these tubular agent payloads with the existing frequencies, which is why we are spending some of our research efforts into looking for a payload of different plants. Have we um, finally cracked the hurdles associated with linking to the I, I think so. Uh, I think there was a, a lot of uh, discussion in the last decade about linker stability and the effect of linker stability on toxicity. I think certainly uh, the ADC approved 10 years ago, Malacar, ha had issues of link. I mean, I would say there are two issues. Why was it so toxic? Well, first it was a DNA acting agent, extremely potent. So if any small amount became free, it, 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 it was going to be very cool. And it was linked in a way that was quite, quite sensitive to the So I think the, the linker systems uh, utilized by Immunogen with the Metansomer technology in the Seattle with the Oristonian technology uh, have overcome that particular labile linker uh, of that first generation ABC. Beyond that, though, I'm not sure that uh, the relative stability of linkers, I'm, I'm not sure really that's the issue anymore. I mean, there are many different forms of linker. It's clear that the, the tox profile, the dose limiting toxicity of these various ADCs that have gone to the clinic is different to the, uh, the free drug. But certainly speaking of the mutansin technology, mutansin itself is horrendously toxic to the GI tract and had uh, tremendous uh, neurotoxicity. Essentially, it just had no therapeutic window. Uh, the 10 or a dozen metansomal ADCs that have gone to the clinic, around 10 of them, and the MTDs have been established. And certainly, we don't see the horrendous GI toxicity at all in any of them. And neurotoxicity, uh, seems to be very modest or not really in the T D one for example it seems to be not an issue at all. And so the linkers are stable enough. And you could actually at least from one perspective say that beyond a certain point the relative stability of the linker may not matter so much. As I come back to a comment that uh, Bob Cohen of Genentech first told me that when you think about it, it all goes somewhere. And most of it, with an ADC, most of it does not go to the tumor. So it almost doesn't matter at one level whether it's metabolized as a small molecular weight compound, or if the whole ADC is taken up by a cell and metabolized, it will become the small molecular weight compound. So it's ultimately the elimination of the payload is always as a small molecular weight derivative. So it all goes somewhere. 
And so I think I think the linker systems now that we can now employ uh, provide adequate stability to overcome the non-specific toxicity of the payload. And then beyond that, now you can tailor the, the, the relative the linker type and class and how labile it is to be released themselves to suit the biological circumstances of the target and the interval and the disease you're going Because I don't think there's one size fits all. At least with Natanson technology, we do see that the different linkers are appropriate in different situations. But all of them are stable enough to the period of toxicity point of view. You attended last year's World ABC Summit in Boston and you're involved in this year's meeting. Can you tell me um, what it means for the ABC community to have a meeting where you can all meet and discuss your work? Well, I think, uh, I think to, to have a whole meeting on ABC, as, uh, as happened last year for the first one, uh, is representative of the field has come of age, that, that finally uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, the biotech industry, realized that this is a, going to be an important drug for us. And, uh, and, and, it, and it could be very important, especially when you set, a, set against it after all, after all of these 30 years of antibody work, how many antibody drugs as naked antibodies actually are approved and, and widely used successfully in treating cancer? It's actually a very modest number. The rituximab, the septin, the bitux, and then its relatives, the epidemic. There is, uh, and this, these are two targets on solid tumors. There is a vast in which targets are factored, not directly on solid tumors. But actually, that's, you could say, actually, after all that work, that's very modest. And I think one of the issues has been potency. I think the ABC technology now has a, a chance of actually creating many more drugs to many more targets. And I think the Seattle Genetics SGM35 is a classic example that they did the experiment. They did have the naked antibody SGM30 in the clinic and really had little activity. Army has, has turned something with no activity into something that looks very promising. And I think that story will be repeated with many antibodies to different targets. So I think to recognize the fact this field could, could actually provide a burgeoning you know, portfolio of, of drugs that are very, very, have a big impact in, on cancer patients. I think to have a conference around it is uh, sort of illustrative of, I guess, this field is kind of Asian. It's been a long time coming, at least for, for me and Tim